suppose the most important thing from being an employer is actually more about the social skills that they have and a lot of the, and their values. And those values normally come from the family environment, uh, what they have, and do those values actually meet you as an employer going forward? The other thing is, uh, you know, being able to communicate, and especially when, when you're out in the employment area there, and it's not the written communication first off, it's actually the verbal communication. And I use an example just uh, near my office, there's a workshop there with a young first year apprentice. And it's his first job, he's, most, he's 16 years of age. And he has good education, but all of a sudden he gets into the work environment and we're talking about terminology and technology and a lot of acronyms, which he's not aware of. And the main thing is that they've got, had the communication skills to ask this and I don't understand, and not afraid to understand and to ask questions. So that's what I see as, as, as some of the soft skills and, and work ready. And also the biggest thing with young people today, and this is the biggest thing, if you're there, be there, and pitch up on time. You know, to use the late uh, Charles Court expression, if you're not five minutes early, you're 10 minutes late, and that doesn't mean arriving at work, still in your sneakers or whatever it may be, it's arriving at work, getting dressed, getting ready, and be at your workplace ready to start on time, and they're the important things to me. And one last thing, and especially to parents, uh, who are sometimes pushing their kids out there, is you can't put in what God left out. Lots of times these young people come out of school and they're going into the workplace only because their parents drive them there, because one of the things we've done with our youth survey is looking at what drives young people for jobs, and a lot of it's still in the families at home. Thank you. Larry. Uh, <clears throat> yes, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try and uh, phrase that uh, question. I'd leave that to someone greater skills than me. Uh, it's, it's so difficult because of the levels that people are coming from and what's work ready for a, a mature age entrant I think is different to um, those who've been through the, and graduated from high school. I graduate's not a word that's used anymore I don't think but have come through the year 12 process and the kids that I used to work with uh, when I ran a school for disengaged students, the most severely disengaged students and for them work ready was all about having the confidence to believe that they could actually do the job. The fact that you could tell them as often as you like, but when one of their mates actually got an apprenticeship, it made the world a difference to the rest of the group. So it, it's a very complex, um, I'm not trying to avoid the issue, but it is very complex to not know when someone is work ready and when they're not. And that um, requires, I think, a different approach in different uh, target groups. Thanks, Larry. Simon. Yeah, I think I agree with Larry. Uh, there are two sort of markets we're looking at, or cohorts we're looking at. The person that's never been in the labour market, so typically young people, school leavers. Jim, I think, makes a very good point. That they need to come up with the right attitude in the first instance and present in the best possible fashion. Then I think there's a mutual responsibility for young people and <coughs> with employers <coughs> because they're not going to be fully formed. And there's always a role for employers to be able to nurture that young person to give them the extra experience and skills that they need. And of course having a qualification does two things. One, it tells someone about the nature of their interest and some of the competence, but I think a lot of the competence for very young people is then further developed on the job. Alternatively, if you have a more experienced worker, um, the employers are looking first of all for work experience, although they will obviously note their credentials and qualifications and where that qualification gives some signal around their technical competence uh, or, or knowledge of the sector. So I think they're quite different cohorts. Um, but in particular for young people, I, I, I think the idea that the training system will fully form a young person ready to hit the ground running um, at 18 is, is ridiculous and I think there is absolutely a mutual responsibility as I think most of us who came through out of our post school, post university days, we're all pretty green. You, you need to be encouraged and helped along the journey to, to develop into a, a, a productive worker. Thanks Simon. Okay, so questions from you. Do we have anybody who would like to ask the panel a question? Very silent group, one over here. 
Oh, hi, okay. I'm Kane DPS from DTWD. I just had a question about, uh, there's a lot of talk about reform of training packages and the current role of the Industry Skills Council. I just wondered if there's still a commitment that all training packages will be reviewed by December this year, if that's still the aim? Uh, yes, the, uh, you're talking about the streamlining process, I think, that was started With a the new training ago. package standards, yeah. Yeah, uh, it, it is the intent to finalise those ones that haven't been streamlined, I'm not quite sure what the proportion is at this stage. And I might add it'll take another six months for these new arrangements to come into play. And the, the reforms that were signalled in the paper on the reform of the products are probably not likely to be affected by the current developers, but more the new developers. Um, and there's still a little uncertainty around precisely what those reforms are. I think the one area that is consistently being talked up, and Jim mentioned it, is uh, this notion of broadbanding, particularly in the lower level quals. So why have, you know, 500 certificate twos when you probably only need 50? Um, and then you specialise a bit as you go up the AQF scale. But it's not absolutely clear where that's going to end up, um, but certainly the intent is to finalise the streamlining process by the end of the year. Thanks, Simon. Right, another question, thank you. One up the back here. Good morning. This is actually a question from one of our Webner delegates. It's a question for Jim Walker from Jackie Swingler Challenger Institute of Technology. And she's wondering whether the Scenario Project Executive Summary is available online for them to engage with. No, it's not, but it will be, I'd say, in about the next four weeks. We're just finalising it right now. Uh, we hope to have it from the State Training Board side of it uh, finished by the end of this month, which is only a few days away, then it goes out for checking and then hopefully in the next four weeks we can get it out on the, uh, on the website. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, Rachel from Future Now Training Council. Um, I think attitudes are changing, but VET is sometimes seen as a less preferred option for students seeking further study. Um, how do you think the VET reforms will address the standards, um, the status or the profile of VET? Did you want me to answer that? I think so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps if I could just clarify the question, you're talking about the standards or you're talking about the status? Um, I think both. So um, what initiatives do you think will improve VET? Well, I mean, look, I think everybody is wanting to address the perception of quality. Um, there's mixed views uh, about whether it is as rotten in Denmark as I think some people are arguing. And, and in fact, one of my first kind of queries when McFarlane came in to do the skills reform agenda that I just mentioned to you before was, is it as bad and is it as broken as people think it is? My personal view is it's not. Um, there are nonetheless been some quite serious issues, particularly around um, exploiting vulnerable people and, and we mentioned vet fee help as, as one area. Um, there are some quality issues and I think uh, they ought to be addressed. We talk about consumer information. I'm not sure how far that'll get and how quickly, although I think it's vital. Uh, and in the end, to a degree, governments have to act on behalf of the vulnerable clients. So in other words, they don't know what they don't know. So um, I would hope better information would be one area. I think the new quality standards um, are a good step as well. Uh, I think it's difficult to regulate quality, you can regulate compliance. Um, quality is a difficult thing to get a hold of sometime. Um, and, and we all just have to really work towards incrementally trying to improve that. I don't know if the status of VET is particularly damaged. Um, I think in some people's eyes, in some areas it might be. Um, I, I think it's still a, a particularly robust system. And, and, and in the broad, and, in the, and most providers to, uh, deliver a quality service because they care. Can I just comment on that? The, I think one of the things that uh, influenced the Minister's decision 
to look at training packages was when he was told how many times some qualifications changed in a 12-month period. And in a competency-based system, did it make any difference to the outcome at the end of the day? Um, not a lot. And so that was a, a compelling argument for those who wanted reform, uh, and it certainly struck a chord with uh, Minister McFarlane. It uh, certainly did with us. Uh, I had to manage a, uh, a closure of an overseas uh, college um, where they were delivering hairdressing, and I was told, oh, no, you can't transfer them to this college because they've got a different training package. Well, I thought, it's a competency-based system. They can cut hair or they can't. And I'm sure that those around you who are very concerned about your hair, and which I'm not quite as much, uh, will find that's a, a bit of a flippant statement. But that's the basics. I think the system is not broken. The system is pretty good. The, the fundamentals, but we just get it a little messy around the edges and think of all these technical things to put around it and that they're really more important than the basic competencies. Jim, did you want to...? No, no I'm pretty comfortable with that. Thank you. Questions? One in the middle here. Thank you, Karen. I'm Kath, I'm Kath Davey um, and manager CareerLink Vetting Schools Cluster. Our students um, attend public and private RTOs and STPs under a fee for service and the students actually leave the school colleges and go to the training providers. They also attend workplace learning. So there's a good balance there of industry and technical training. One of the panel members mentioned uh, with the introduction of vet fee help. You can have um this difference in fees with the notion that no one has to pay until they reach a, an income of $50,000 or 53000 or whatever it is. So that, that's where it's, it's become a bit of a mystery. And, I, and the uh, uh, consumer, the ACCC, has, has, has stepped into the space to say, you've actually got to explain this a lot better. RTOs have got to be a lot better explaining what the implications of having that loan are, the fact that when you go down to buy a car and get a loan, you've got this debt sitting there. Um, that's not explained to them the, the impact of those fees, of those loans, sorry. Simon. Were you talking on behalf of school students or, or when they exit school? Yeah, sorry, when they are school students. Yeah. yeah, I don't think vet fee help really comes into it um, because it's only extended for diploma students, whether it's on a full fee paying or, or a subsidised basis. So. Um, there are a scattering of school students doing diplomas, um, but by and large they're not. Uh, so I don't think it's a risk at the school level. Um, it's really for post-school destinations. I, the brokers have been into schools, I know that, looking to, to sign them up. But of course, to go into a loan with an underage person, you've got to have someone guarantee that loan. So that's a protection in the school system. Jim, did you want to make any comment? Yeah, just from being a uh, employer and also having vet in schools, and you know, West Track had a number of schools in there, and they were private schools. But what we tried to do was look at the future, and actually we sponsored a fair bit of the the vet in schools. We didn't charge a full amount. We looked at it as as a, as a way of also looking at the possibility of seeing which were our future apprentices that we could actually look and see before they actually applied. So we looked at it from a different way than perhaps what a lot of other employers did, and. I'd say around about 75% uh, of those young people five, apply for apprenticeships and most probably out of that 75%, about another three quarters actually got jobs first off. So it was a worthwhile system for the employer to actually have young students there. Thank you. So we've got time for one more question and I'm, I'm going to give you that particular question. Um, each of you have spoken about the importance of better information to students. And Larry, you made the point, is a website enough? Uh, implying that it isn't. So let's put you back into your um, position as, as uh, parents, I think all three of you are parents, and say to you, ask you, if you had a kid ready to go into the VET system now, what advice would you give them about being better informed to make the right choice about how they should train? Larry, can we start with you, please? Um, I think, I'm not sure what advice to give the student. I think as the system we need to provide better information and access to better information. That may be websites, but it's got to be better than the ones we've got at the moment. But the place that most students get information, as far as I'm aware, 
is peers. So it's peer to peer and it gets into the social network now um, and that's where they get their information from. We can put all we like onto uh, official websites like MySkills but it'll be students talking to students who go, oh this is good, this is bad and, and I don't understand how to to make sure that the quality of information that goes into that social network is actually of, of good quality. It's, um, it is tricky and uh, they're very, I learned um, back when I worked in the department about how difficult it is to communicate with students. Um, we, we tried full page ads in the paper and then one of our staff said, oh no, no, we, we look at the, the two dollar ads at the back of the paper, that'd be for us, that's not for us. It didn't matter what the message said, that's not for us, it's too big. So, yeah, I don't understand students. <laughs> Thank you. Jim, do you understand them any better? <laughs> actually, the answer is no, but after doing the, the survey, which is actually on our website right now, it's just been released the last couple of weeks, one of the things that is coming out is that uh, careers advisors at schools are the least used information for the students. And, in my, and my thought was that that would be the most used, but it's the least most used. So it gets back to the parents. So if I was studying all over again, because my three children are, are all growing up, if I was studying over again, I'd try to be a lot more informed than, 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 than what I was to give them advice. Uh, also, what's, what's come out of the youth survey is that they actually use their own friends a fair bit. So it's looking at who their friends are and seeing what they're doing. And also the aunt and uncles, making sure that they're informed as well. But, you know, getting the, 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 your children out to skills opportunities, skills programs. And I think also from the point of view as an employer, uh, if you can go out there and get around the schools and get around those places and have open days for, for people to come in and see what's going on. Because a lot of young people, when they actually hit the workplace, they have no idea what that workplace is like. And I think parents, we've lost most probably track of what's out there as well because, you know, I've got a fair few grey hairs, so I'm a little bit out of date too in some of the other places of employment other than what I've worked in. Thank you, Jim. And Simon, you're the father of a, a man currently going through this process? Yeah, a boy man. Um, <laughs> <coughs> well, it's interesting you should say that because uh, it's probably easier if I use his experiences in second year university, um, but it's analogous anyway. Um, and, you know, in this particular instance, it's a large university and from the outside looking in a, a bit of a sausage factory. Um, there is not a lot of information other than the schedule that you might arrive at in the first day of precisely how something is going to be taught, for example. Um, now these are the Generation Z, so they, they like online, they like the idea of not having to attend, so you've got to accommodate that. But I'm a bit old fashioned. If you're, if you're paying for a service, particularly an extended service like education, could go six months, 12 months, four years, well, what exactly is the service I'm going to get over that period? And they're not questions that are typically asked. So um, if you're gonna enrol in, and go back to VET in a, in a certificate four, you would naturally expect, and, and I know this will shock all those people that say we've gotta be flexible and deal with different cohorts, but if, you, if you're doing a, an intense training program that gets to a level of a certificate four, you would naturally want to have six months of reasonably intensive training. Um, and I know that doesn't wash with a lot of people that say it's all competency based, you go at your own level, but for young people, they should be getting a pretty formal, standardised intensity of training, and, and I think the new term is volume of learning, uh, and I think they're critical factors. Um, and really the biggest shonks going out there at the moment are people getting uh, offered a certificate in two days. Um, manifestly, that is not possible to train someone from scratch in that period. There is unfortunately a tension there because as a student you might think, well that's great, I can get in and out of this and I can get my ticket and I'm on, I'm on my way. I would absolutely be disabusing kids, or my kids, of that notion. You actually got to put something in, you got to receive a decent service, otherwise you are not going to develop those skills. Authorised by the Government of Western Australia, Perth.